Sir Anthony, the wonder worker of Padua, combined in his person many traits. He had early in life entered the canons regular of St. Augustine there in Portugal, but he had been set on fire at the evangelical wave of the new-born Franciscan order and was attracted by the prospect of giving his life entirely, even eventually as a martyr, by going to a land where he knew that that was a, a certain risk. It was going to North Africa. The project of man is one thing and project of God is another. And it was in Europe that he was to exercise his ministry all over Italy and as far as France. It was by chance that his gift of preaching came to the surface, for he had to give an impromptu sermon at short notice, and people realised what they had when they heard him. But he was also important for the embryonic order, for he knew the importance of study, and that under him became also a trait of the Franciscan order, which otherwise could have gone in a very popular way, and only that. The balance then came in with him, and it is not without reason that he is a doctor of the church, unexpected, given his short life. He was only 36 when he died. And when human beings would not listen, he would turn to the fish, and say to them, you fish who actually acted in the gospel, in obedience to the Lord, listen to the word of the Lord. And they would pop their heads up above the water and listen willingly while the sons of men had other things to do. <coughs> that is actually a bit familiar. Listening to somebody in a nursing home who was saying how the rosary was said in the nursing home but mentioned that it was said at high speed did have this to say they're in a hurry for what I don't know that sums up the whole of life in a hurry but for what I don't know why do we get through our prayers as though the important thing was to follow? And why do we take so much care of what is outside our soul and come to the end of our life with our soul utterly neglected? These preachers had an effect for they set before the eyes of their listeners and those who came to see them from afar the truth of what was theirs. And the preacher must be on fire. Otherwise, no matter how true his words, he will not ignite the listeners. And even if a speech is perfectly prepared word for word and delivered but bread, word for word, perfectly, it is not necessarily going to have any effect. Why? Because the ignition is not there. And these great preachers knew the importance of igniting. They have to be interesting. And one point remembered is more important than a long speech in which one was absent. That is, the listeners were engaged in their own thoughts because the preacher was not interesting and could not captivate their attention. The Lord himself was the model. He used things that we still remember because we see them before our eyes, parables. In school days, looking back, there was a time when unexpectedly Providence 
was at work, quite out of the blue actually. It was a time way back when doubts with regard to the Christian faith itself, to God himself and all that went with it, were coming in and I had to resolve them. And so, to get some input, I went repeatedly to the Central Library in Cardiff to see if there was any proof for God and read all kinds of things like William Paley and these who talked about proofs of the existence of God and looked also into any possibility of finding light from the lives of the saints. And so it is that I found Butler's Lives of the Saints in several volumes and started with A and one of the first to be read was Anthony of Padua, the saint of this day. I skimmed over it and went quickly and on and on. But months later, something that I had read quickly at that point came to my mind. There was a passage in one saint where, according to the life, not only did he hold the infant Jesus in his hands, but also he converted a Jew who had no faith by doing something which was a bit puzzling for an evangelical Protestant. He got this Hebrew to put his mule to a fast and to bring him to him fasting and to place before him a sack of meal. He, however, had to bring him there where the saint was going to be in this outside chapel. And the saint came to face the mule with the blessed sacrament in his hand and said, Dumb beast, adore your God. And the mule refused to touch that interesting menu that was prepared for him in the bag and knelt humbly before the blessed sacrament. I had dismissed it initially when I had first seen that, but then it haunted me, what if that is true? And so it led me to read on about these miracles, which as I found out, were quite often, like that one, underlying not just the power of God, but Catholic dogma, which was something we never found in the Protestant faith. God answered prayer, but never in such a way as to say something through the actual miracle in itself, with regard to a specific dogma. Years later, I found myself in Italy, and not yet ordained, I went with the novitiate to Rimini, where we have friends in the Comunio e Liberazione movement, and we, by chance, came to that chapel with the cross marked on it, on the ground outside, where the mule knelt. And I wrote these lines, grateful to the mule for converting me. This is the place where happened the miracle that in adolescence made me think. Dumb beast that taught the world without a word, the word to heed, therewith to bend the knee. Twas this thine inward thinking that I heard, this thy clear vision that I once did see through gazing on a page wherein the age 
of reason ceased to be. For all was sad. Good knew that altered more than any sage in this thy strangest greeting of strange bread. Twas but a day like this that came this way. All days with but a nay for a to bend. And now I see, blessed preacher, that thy bray, a volume of hid sermons here, did end, and that a particle, and that a little particle would hold enough to groom a shepherd.